soon. So for those that have joined us, apologies for the technical glitches. We're still not quite sure what happened, but it would seem the webinars functionality across the university, if not broader, uh, went down. Uh, so we were unable to start the webinar. And you've all got the link now. So we're going to run this as a Zoom meeting, in effect, uh, an expanded meeting. So that should make for some interesting dynamics, um, but bear with us. So my name is Peter Draper. I'm the head of the Institute for International Trade at the University of Adelaide in South Australia. Um, and I'm joined online by uh, two co-authors of this report that we're launching today. Uh, in Adelaide, Dr. Desi Amble, uh, who's uh, part of the Institute, and in the Cape in South Africa, Somerset West, we have Hilton Zunko. So thanks for staying the course and waiting for the link. We, we appreciate that. We'll now get underway. So I'll just very quickly set out um, the broad objectives of the report. So in essence, the the purpose of it was to look into the changing world of agricultural subsidy entitlements. And as is evident, I think from the report, um, it really is a shifting terrain and shifting in the sense that the entitlements have grown hugely over the last uh, couple of decades or so, uh, certainly since the Uruguay Round agreements were concluded. Um, so it's a data-rich report. We really wanted to get into this obviously from an African point of view because this paper does focus on African trade interests um, and to understand how this growth of domestic support entitlement reforms potentially affects African agricultural interests. So when I say African agricultural interests, I mean both production and trade. Now, this was a relatively small budget project, so we did not have a budget to do detailed modeling work, so you won't see that in the report. It's really an empirical exercise, and along the way, we're also exploring how the data that we're presenting uh, relates to the evolution of African negotiating positions in the ongoing agricultural reform negotiations in Geneva. I'll quickly state what the high level core conclusions are, and then I'll ask my colleagues to present a little bit of data, uh, but also some of the key findings of the report along the way. So the headline finding or conclusion is that this growth of entitlements, we'll show you the data shortly, is a potentially a risky proposition for African agriculture. Um, and very importantly, the agricultural subsidies issue is clearly no longer just a developed country phenomenon in the sense that the problem, so to speak, is no longer concentrated in developed countries. It's more well beyond that. Um, relating this to African group negotiating positions in Geneva, those positions tend to be motivated uh, crudely characterizing. Uh, by equity considerations primarily. There's some, obviously some good hard-headed calculations in there too, but it's the equity consideration that really stands out. And our assessment is that those are not sufficiently grounded in real economic interests. So a core purpose of the report is to bring to the fore those core economic interests. Um, so the underlying conclusion is that we think the Africa group needs to rethink its position in the light of these uh, its growth and agricultural subsidies and entitlements, and specifically to move beyond uh, a focus on developing country solidarity to focus on their own agricultural interests. And of course, along the way to seek appropriate trade-offs for, for doing so, one of which could be a closer alignment with the Cairns group position, which has argued explicitly for removal of agricultural subsidies and entitlements. So that's broadly uh, the objectives, but also the key conclusions of the report. We'll turn now to some of the details, and I'll ask my colleague Jesse Amble to unmute and to let us through the first couple of slides. Jesse. Thank you, Peter. 
Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, wherever in the world you are. Um, I will be presenting uh, the trade and the production empirical analysis for this project. Uh, so I will start with uh, figure one. So uh, this figure represents uh, the top 15 uh, African agricultural export uh, products. So this is from 2011 to 2019, and we analyze the top 15 harmonized uh, system uh, six digit uh, export products. So uh, as you can see from the figure, the top uh, exported items are cocoa beans, cashew nuts, coffee, tobacco, and uh, cotton. And we ranked these export products uh, based on the average export from 2017 uh, to 2000. Uh, 19, so that is three years. Uh, and some in interesting insight from this chart are the following. So the first one is Africa exports both uh, raw materials and processed uh, agri agricultural goods. For example, you can see cocoa bean is uh, it's a raw agricultural product. So Africa exports a significantly large amount of uh, cocoa bean. And Africa also exports uh, some processed agricultural goods, for example, cacao paste. Uh, and uh, uh, cacao paste is just one example, and cacao butter is another example. So these are some processed agricultural goods. Uh, the other interesting insight from this chart is the export list also includes some heavily subsidized uh, agricultural products. For example, cotton, sugar, tobacco, and tomato are highly subsidized agricultural products. So these are top export items by Africa. The other uh, important point is uh, African agricultural export growth is it's highly volatile and it is also very low. So this is what uh, figure one shows. Next slide. Yeah, next, uh, we just present the top uh, cocoa bean exporting African countries. So the first one shows the top four cocoa bean uh, Af uh, exporters. Uh, and as you can see, West African countries dominate the cocoa bean exporting. So almost 70% of uh, the world's cocoa bean production is uh, uh, made by West African countries. So because of that, they also export the largest share of uh, cocoa bean. Um, the chocolate industry. So cocoa bean is an important ingredient for chocolate industry. And the net worth for the global chocolate industry is almost 150 billion. But since Africa export low value added uh, cocoa bean, uh, it, also, it only accounts almost 6 billion of the 150 billion global chocolate industry. So this is significantly low. Uh, and Africa value addition uh, could be low because of uh, high subsidy provided by the major uh, chocolate producer countries. For example, sugar and milk are the two important uh, chocolate ingredients. And these are highly subsidized by the majors. So we'll come back to this uh, later. And there are also some uh, East African countries that are producing uh, cocoa bean. Okay, figure two produces, uh, I mean, it, it, it indicates the top 15 uh, agricultural import products. Again, this is from 2011 to 2019, uh, harmonized system six digit. So the top five, agricultural import products are wheat and uh, muslin, that is the top uh, imported agricultural product, followed by durum wheat, mild rice, maize, and palm oil, okay? And some interesting uh, points from this chart is, uh, the first one is imports of wheat, uh, sugar, cigarette have shown a significant increase in the last decade. Another important point is Africa uh, exports tobacco and it imports cigarettes. So tobacco is a raw material, cigarette is a processed uh, good. Uh, the other important point is wheat, rice, uh, sugar, and maize are 
also highly subsidized import products. So this is good for African uh, consumers, but it is bad for African uh, uh, farmers. Uh, another important point is Africa imports staple food. Next slide. Uh, next, let's see the top uh, production agricultural items for Africa. So we just present the top agricultural products for 15 major uh, trading African countries. So the top uh, produced item in Africa is maize, followed by wheat, sugarcane, rice, and tomato. So these are the top five uh, production items. Now, when we see the production items, Africa produces staples, but still it is not enough. So that's why we see a large import from the previous chart. Uh, Africa has also comparative advantage uh, in these agricultural items. So that means there is a future uh, export potential by African countries. So the interesting point here is, uh, does African uh, production of uh, staple agricultural uh, goods uh, suppressed by domestic support. So we'll see this in the following uh, section. Next slide. Yeah, another important point is, I think we also need to know where does African export uh, products are uh, going? And we need also to know the major import sources for African agricultural imports. So the first graph uh, shows the major uh, export destinations. So this is in billions of USD. So the top export destination for African agricultural goods is EU. So this is because of the, uh, the close geographical uh, uh, proximity between the two continents and because of the colonial relationship between the two uh, continents. So because of that, EU import, imports a large uh, agricultural goods from Africa. And the next one is US, China, and India. And when we go to the import uh, sources, so you can see Brazil is the top import source uh, for African agricultural imports, followed by European Union, Argentina, United States, and Russia. So if these countries are subsidizing their agricultural sector, then it will have a significant impact on agricultural uh, trade in Africa and agricultural production uh, in Africa. So in the next section, we have seen the extent uh, uh, evolution and uh, components of agricultural domestic support by the major uh, agricultural producers. So Hilton will present the, the, the next uh, slides. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Daisy, and, uh, and to Peter, and uh, greetings to everyone from the southern point of Africa down, uh, down in uh, Cape Town. And I'm very pleased to join you this morning to talk about some important agricultural issues for, uh, for African countries. Um, so to link on to the numbers that, that Daisy's presented and uh, our profile of, of African imports, exports, uh, and production, um, if we turn now to, uh, to just some of the data on, on subsidization, we're going to start here with, uh, um, with our iconic AG 171 picture. Uh, I think this thing is going to stand us in good stead for several years. We'll definitely be using it in the classroom um, and on many platforms uh, that uh, talk about agricultural trade and the negotiations, um, we, we see this picture referred to in, in various guises. Now, for, for me as an African um, trader, um, the interesting part about this is uh, the general amber box picture that we see um, shown here in red um, as the, the final bound total aggregate, aggregate measure of support that lies on the top of the graph. And you'll see from um, the picture that that is basically um, a fixed quantum, right? So it almost looks like it's growing, but it's, it's just lying uh, 
on top of the yellow part, which is actually the, the part that is growing. So from, from the Uruguay round, um, we have the 32 countries um, that have amber box entitlements, and this is fixed over, over time. And, it, and as you can see, as the years go on uh, to 2030, uh, this element remains, um, remains fixed. And then below it, we have the de minimis allowances, which are you know, essentially the five plus five for developed and 10 plus 10 for developing, 8.5 for, uh, for some others. And you know, back in the day, uh, de minimis meant too small to be concerned about. So the red part was the rule and the yellow part was intended to be the exception to the rule or the sugar that would help you take the medicine in adopting these disciplines in the Uruguay round. Now, what we've seen over time is that our, our inability to make progress uh, under the built-in agenda of Article 20 has flipped this picture around in that now, the exception from the Uruguay round in modern times has become the new rule. So the exception is now, is now outweighing um, the, original, the original amber box. Um, as it was in, in the in the Uruguay round, which is which is a strange and I think unintended consequence of those who had already um, you know who, who had not foreseen this um, back in those days. Uh, Peter, can you bring up the next uh, the next two and the next one? Right. So as an African, when I looked at this picture um, and then considered the number, the type of numbers that Desi showed, I saw that my interest is covered by reforming amber subsidies in totality. So my interest is this whole graph. And yet, when I look at, at where my negotiators are, are pitching their focus, we, we're having a look at the historical uh, injustices and imbalances of the past. Um, and then people have said to me, Hilton, but you've been changing your, you've been changing your tune, you know, from uh, the kind of work you were doing in, uh, back in 2005, for instance. Um, and I, I don't think this is the case. Uh, I think um, I've always been a proponent of uh, reform of the, of the amber box. And there's no doubt that uh, those historical imbalances existed. Um, the impacts of what's happened in, in that red slab uh, of the graph, I, I don't think are, are in dispute. Um, but what I see is I see that the, the, world, has, uh, the world has changed somewhat um, and become a different place. And if I'm going to cover my interest now, um, I can't just focus on, on reform of the red slab. Um, I, I also have to pay attention to this huge um, yellow wedge. Uh, thank you, Peter. So if we look at our slab and our, and our wedge, uh, who, who is, who is uh, um, providing this, uh, this support? So, so if, if, we ha if we have a look there, um, the chart is showing us um, the several different kinds of support to relate it back to the previous picture. Um, if we look at, the, at those two together, the FB TAMs and the de minimis are the, the little purple triangles. Um, and we see in, in place number one is China. Okay, Peter, you can load the next ones. Then the European Union. Next one. Then India. And finally, the US. So if I had looked at this picture back in, uh, in say, 1999, um, numbers two and four, would have been leading the, the charge. Um, and now the world is a different place. Um, now I see the, the leading um, developing countries um, by way of China and India um, coming strongly into this, into this picture. And interestingly enough, these four are from DESI's charts, also the top four export destinations for African products. Thank you, Peter. So if we have a look at, at the, the top 10 subsidizers um, and then using what information is available on, on product specific support, 
Uh, and in the numbers analysis, we used both information from the WTO notifications as well as, as that of the, the OECD. Uh, and what, what we see here is if you look back at, uh, at the, the charts that Desi has shown us, you'll see that the, the products that are receiving the most support are also the products that are of specific interest to, to African countries. Um, and the maize one to me is, a, is an, an important one in particular uh, because maize is our biggest agricultural uh, production product um, on the continent. And we also see that, um, that South Africa, that Afri South Africa uh, is an exporter of maize, but most African countries uh, are also finding themselves in a position of, of, of being an importer of maize. And perhaps what a chart like this says to us, that in, in some of these, these products, uh, like maize, uh, cotton is a very well-documented uh, example, that, uh, that potentially we, we have some good export potential here uh, if that depressing weight of the subsidies is lifted from these products. Thank you, Peter. Okay, then the next point to make is that in, in the discourse, um, African countries are often making reference to policy space um, and that we need policy space for, for subsidies. Um, and this, this is an ongoing dynamic. Um, I, I recall uh, for the Nairobi ministerial when we had finally put the export subsidies to bed, um, this, this was one of the calls and concerns that were raised by African countries is yes, but what about the policy space for the future? If other countries have done these, these things in the past, uh, as we hurtle up the development curve, aren't we going to need these things? Well, if we just have, have a look at this, this picture, uh, the line at the top is showing the, the spending that the majors are doing, and the green line at the bottom is showing uh, what, what Africa spends on, on subsidies. So it's fairly clear to see that Africa is not playing this game. Africa is, is, is not in the, in the subsidies game, and it's extremely unlikely uh, to virtually impossible that this gap is, is ever going to be closed, not in my lifetime anyway, um, in relative subsidization. Uh, thanks, Peter. Then one caveat, uh, a footnote to this is that, Peter, can you just go up again? Is if we look at that, that low level of African subsidization, uh, intuitively, um, and from some of the numbers we've looked at, the line appears to be right. But we're not completely sure because African countries are notoriously uh, missing in action when it comes to notifying their, their subsidies. And even those that they do notify, um, you know, in, in the way that the WTO's notification process works, if I make a notification, you list me as, as being 100% compliant, right, in, in the notification reporting, and I look very good. But you'll see if you look at the countries that DESI has identified as the top the top traders and producers of African products. There's some countries there that are notifying that they give no support whatsoever. Um, and this is impossible. So even though you, you're getting a gold star as, as showing 100% for making a notification, clearly many of these notifications uh, are, are, are not correct. Um, and when we call for transparency, this is, this is one of the items that African countries can also attend to and where we have a further contribution to make. Right, thank you. And then having, you know, having a look at, at where potential allies um, are for, for the Africa group in, in the negotiations. We noted that back in, in May of this year, that the Africa group and the Cairns group um, had, had a joint statement um, declaring that they were going to um, cooperate for MC12 um, in, uh, in domestic support reform. So you will see in the paper, we've, we've kind of uh, you know, mapped in a tabular form um, where the similarities and differences lie. 
Um, and so I think it's obvious for uh, two negotiating groups to put out a, a joint statement that conceptually you, you have to be aligned to be able to do that. And I think the, the research also shows that, um, that we, we, in effect, pulling in the, in the same direction. There are, however, differences. And what we identified is what we've named the DDG um, pivot. And this would mean that um, Africa is being more conservative on the development box and the de minimis, those are the two Gs, and the CANS group on the green box. So if, these, if we were going to level, um, level the pivot, we would have to see the, the African contingent moving on the development box, perhaps, and definitely on the, on the de minimis, um, and the CANS group being prepared to accept further disciplines uh, on, on the green box, which are, are, are not in their scope um, at the moment. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Hilton, and thanks, Tessie. Um, we wanted to have a bit more time for discussion and, and conversation, but obviously with the technical problems, that's more challenging now. Uh, and also, we now have people in the format of a Zoom meeting and not just a webinar. So I can actually, this is quite interesting, I can pick on people if I, if I want to. And I did see earlier, I hope he's still on the line, um, Edwini Kessi, who's in the WTO Secretariat, Di Director for Agriculture, amongst other things, I think that Desi was doing. And I'm wondering if I can ask uh, Edwini, to offer any brief thoughts you might have on the presentation of this, this report. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, clearly, I, I read the report with great interest. I think it touches on a lot of the issues that we are grappling here with at the WTO, particularly um, in the negotiations. Clearly, domestic support is an issue of concern, not only to African countries, but other members as well. African countries know that we need to have, they need to be cuts because as the study um, pointed out, um, and the Keynes group has made it quite clear, um, trade distorting support will soon reach a trillion dollars. And if nothing is done, it's going to, um, if nothing is done, it's going to reach 2 trillion by 2030. And this would have significant implications for the African continent because Africa has a lot of potential in the agricultural sector. It is still untapped. And given the considerable resource endowment, Africa can become a huge agricultural exporter. But this is very dependent on the situation at the international level. So African countries have a lot of interest in seeing to it that the support is disciplined. Otherwise, it would clearly compromise the ability to increase their sector. So I think the study gives food for thought. And hopefully, African countries would modify their negotiating positions in light of this study. Sometimes the positions adopted by African countries, there is a disconnect uh, between what they are pursuing and what they should really be doing, given their um, interest. So I hope that a lot of, I think that study has been circulated among African delegates. I know some of them, um, I sent it personally to a number of African ambassadors and agricultural negotiators. And I think they would read it. And hopefully once we come back and we restart the negotiations in January, hopefully it would change or it would actually help um, the African countries to pursue their interests. Already, as I said, they are very clear. They are very clear in the sense that they know that um, it has to be disciplined and all countries do. But sometimes the positions of African countries are not fully articulated. And I hope this study would help them to um, you know, have a very informed view and then they would be able to pursue their interests fully in the negotiations. But I think overall the study um, it's a good contribution to the discourse in this area. Thank you very much, Peter. Great, thanks. Thanks, Adrini. Appreciate that. And noting the African line behind you as a certain yeah. answer to, you, to, to your remarks. Um, colleagues, I think you should be able to raise your virtual hand, which will pop you up on my screen as wanting to make an intervention. Uh, but otherwise, you'll need to 
pop uh, a question or a comment into the chat and we can take it from there. Um, if there aren't any takers, I might just pick on some others that, that I know <laughs> on the call because we still have a few more minutes. And it's a very meaty report as we, we've set out. So there's certainly plenty to discuss. All right, I'm not noting a great uh, preponderance of hands going up. Um, who can I pick on? <laughs> Tanash, any thoughts to offer? Hi, Peter, thanks very much. I was actually thinking of raising my hand when I wanted to uh, feed on the in, in, in sentiments from the, from the group. Um, uh, thanks very much, colleagues, for, for this presentation. I think it's quite useful and very insightful. Well, what I was thinking while um, the presentation was ongoing, I think there was this graph uh, that is projecting uh, the level of support all up to 2030. But I, 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 I think the projections may have been made sometime in 2016. And we are now in 2021. Um, and I wanted to find out if, if, if those projections have panned out. I mean, the last five years, uh, we've had quite a bit of um, upheaval in agricultural markets. We've had COVID, we've had uh, quite a lot of spending um, globally in food markets and trying to get some of these supply chains uh, working efficiently. Um, we've also had quite a number of uh, climate events. Um, and my anticipation is the, the amount of spending in ag may have uh, shifted beyond what may have been projected in 2016. So I wanted to find out if, they, uh, if we have any sight of the data more recent data around uh, the levels of support or uh, are we still having issues of countries not adequately reporting? So we probably don't have more recent data around um, the levels of support. Yeah, thanks, Tanash. There's certainly plenty of issues with data, and we grappled with a lot of those in the report. I might call Desi out on this one, and then we have a raised hand from Rebecca Barton. And I should just point out while Desi is collecting his thoughts to answer that question, in the rush to get you online. I forgot to mention that this report was uh, funded by DFA, the Australian Department for Foreign Affairs and Trade. So, uh, and Rebecca is with DFAT in Geneva. So I think she will have an up-to-date and fresh perspective on what's been going on in the Geneva space. Um, and particularly, I guess, uh, Rebecca, since the cancellation of MC12, which <laughs> disappointed many of us. Jesse, if you have a comment on data issue. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, so in this uh, uh, report, uh, we have, uh, yeah, in this report, we have uh, analyzed uh, top African agricultural uh, export products uh, at harmonized uh, system six digit level. We have also analyzed the import uh, products, again, at uh, HS6 level. And we just analyze uh, which countries are, uh, uh, next week we analyze which countries are the major uh, export destination and import source. And then we see the major agricultural production items. So after we analyze uh, uh, trade and production, then uh, we just identify which countries are the top uh, subsidy provider uh, countries, we find that uh, US, EU, uh, India, uh, China, and other countries that Hilton presents, they are the major uh, 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 trading partners for Africa. And uh, so if these countries provide subsidies, then it will harm African agricultural trade and agricultural uh, production. So after that, we just continue to analyze the different types uh, subsidies that are provided by uh, 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 these these countries, 
and we analyze their potential for harming uh, African agricultural uh, goods. So that's what we did in the data analysis section. So our data is taken from, uh, the subsidy data is taken from uh, WTO, uh, uh, and the trade uh, and production data is taken from uh, uh, different sources. Production is taken from uh, uh, FAO. So that's what we did in the data analysis section. Uh, maybe if there is additional uh, insight, maybe Hilton can add on this. Well, so maybe just to round out on that, Desi, and Ken Nash, who is also one of our co-authors, uh, and he he's recently retired from the OECD, where he headed the Trade and Agriculture Director. So in the appendix, we look at the OECD data, which is much more up to date uh, to Nash. But the OECD data is not directly transferable into the, if you like, the currency or the language of the WTO. So, so um, we needed to rely on, on the data available that the WTO provide, which is in turn based on the data that member states provide. And then the WTO has to take that through a process um, to provide concordance because the data tends to be provided in different national currencies. There's all sorts of exchange rate issues. And if the data is not up to date, there's very little the WTO secretariat can do about that. And I guess this goes to Hilton's broader point about transparency notifications and so on, and getting things up to date so that we have an accurate picture. And then analysts like us can give you the latest uh, true analysis or picture. So just before I bring Rebecca in, um, I was just noting a question in the chat uh, or maybe a comment from Ziad Ibrahim, who used to work in the WTO Secretariat some time ago. And he's making the point that um, structural adjustment packages over the years uh, have yeah. resulted in many cases, I guess, and reduced support to agriculture in Africa. Um, I'm sure that's true, Ziad, you would know better than me. You, you worked in the development division. That was not a core focus of this report, but I guess the underlying point you're making is it challenges the policy space if you are being obliged, so to speak, to reduce your agricultural subsidies that you pay domestically because you are in a fund program. I think that's the point that you, you're making. Uh, so, Rebecca, I'll turn to you. Hi everyone, uh, I just seem to have some problems with um, starting my video actually, I'm not quite sure why, so I'm really sorry for that. Um, oh, here we go. Now I've been given permission I think to do that, we'll see if that works. Uh, anyhow, thank you for such an interesting presentation, um, Peter, Hilton and Desi, and Desi I love your um, backdrop of the jacaranda trees. They bring back very, very fond memories of a posting in Pretoria, which is, of course, where I first met Peter um, just a few years ago. Um, I think some of the key points um, that Hilton, that you made uh, this morning, Geneva time, uh, and that are in the paper in terms of um, the top four entitlement holders also being the top four destination for African agricultural exports and the fact that um, certainly the most heavily subsidised um, product, maize, and then the second cotton are key um, exports of interest from Africa are really important um, points to illustrate on the need for reform and how critical that is to African uh, economic and development interests. Um, some of the key points that we make here on, on the need for broad domestic support reform uh, are based on work done, uh, a lot of work done by Canada through their analytical tool and work done through Costa Rica in analysing um, entitlements and subsidy use. Uh, the top 10 entitlement holders, Amber Box, uh, account for 80% of all global amber box entitlements. Another figure, the top 10 subsidizers account for roughly 92% of subsidy use. 
So one of the key points that we try to make here in Geneva is that um, a domestic support reform effort must encompass the concept of proportionality where members with the biggest entitlements and the biggest potential to distort markets should make the biggest contribution. So it's about leveling the playing field where um, those, those big entitlement holders and big subsidizers, big subsidizers would need to make um, the biggest cuts. Um, just quickly on the question raised earlier on um, use of data and whether it needs to be updated. Certainly um, that graph, the red and yellow graph that Hilton spent some time discussing um, was based on work done mostly in 2019 um, and always is always space for updating our analysis, of course. Um, but I would also draw everyone's attention to the FAO, UNDP, UNEP recent report, which um, had a similar figure. It was US um, 1.8 trillion by 2030. Um, and of course, the, that report made the very important um, uh, argument that of the more than uh, 500 billion uh, in current domestic support levels, over two thirds of that is considered distorting or harmful to the environment and human health. So there are there, and that of course um, is consistent and supports work that the OECD uh, has been doing for for well over a decade now. Um, I just wanted to make one quick point um, on the pivot graph that was presented. Um, just to say that a number of CANS group members um, have been very um, um, forward leaning and active on the need for the green box to be included in a domestic reform discussion, but not, there's a very clear distinction in that not for it to be included in a cap and reduce reform effort, noting that, of course, Annex 2 support uh, should be um, have minimal or no distorting effects, um, and in fact, as as um, the IIT IIT report points out, um, we want green box expenditure to increase, particularly in Africa. Um, but uh, the view that many hold in the CANS group is that the green box should be included in a discussion, as it is already included in the chair's draft text for MC12. Um, to make sure that the measures in that box um, and the criteria are being adhered to. I think those are some of the key key points that I wanted to make. Um, um, and, and just to thank you again for everyone's contribution and for being here today. It's really interesting. Right. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so Leslie Wentworth, hello, Leslie, uh, asks in the chat, and I'll Flip this one to Desi to answer. In terms of African country disaggregation, are these top 15 countries selected at aggregate level or per agricultural product? Desi. Uh, thank you, Peter. So uh, these top 15 African uh, agricultural uh, producer countries or uh, trader countries are selected based on uh, the top 15 imported and exported products. It's not based on the aggregate uh, products. Okay, short and sweet. Uh, so Joel Awuru asks, um, one of the key challenges of Africa agriculture is lack of infrastructure and agricultural subsidies are not viable in most African countries, he suggests. And how can this challenge be addressed? So I guess that that's the linkage between lack of infrastructure, but also lack of money to pay subsidies. Uh, I guess that's a development box question, I'm not sure. But Hilton, let me flick that one to you. Let's see what you, you make of it. Yes, Peter, I think that's an important point to make. And uh, I think one that, that we often like to ignore. Uh, we like to place all the, all the blame for our woes uh, on, on subsidies in, in the major countries. 
Um, whereas it's true, we, we, in Africa, we have substantial supply side constraints um, that we also have to attend to. And, and clearly, um, you know, infrastructure development is, is, is one of these. And of course, interestingly, this also plays into uh, our consideration um, of, of where our allies lie in negotiations, because, uh, you know, we, we're living in a time where negotiate, we like to silo negotiating topics. So, uh, you know, that old concept of nothing is agreed till everything is agreed and that the three pillars of agreement on agriculture are interlinked, that there's an underlying logic to this. We, we see there's more and more pressure to, uh, to kind of unpack these things. Um, which I think is dangerous, and uh, I, you know I think one one has to also look at at where the you, you know where the, the the larger dynamic is in your international relations with other countries, um, and with China in particular, um, the Chinese are our great friends in improving uh, infrastructure in in the African continent, and uh, by far the biggest at, at present the biggest in, investor in in infrastructure development. Um, so you know if you work that in in the, into a more granular level on, uh, you know, who are our friends in, and allies in uh, agricultural negotiations. Uh, we, we can't ignore these things. Um, but infrastructure development, certainly, um, and I think this has also come very strongly to the fore in our African continental free trade area agreement, where we've, we've realized that the, the interconnectivity between African countries is going to be crucial if, we, if we're really going to mine the, the benefits um, of the continental agreement. Great, thanks, Hilton. So we're running up against the time constraint, colleagues. I've got two more questions in the chat that are good ones. I think we should try and answer them quickly. Um, so from Tanash, are carbon emission commitments likely to moderate or exacerbate the levels of trade distorting subsidies among developed countries? And I guess the answer to that is mixed, but uh, Hilton, do you want to give that a go? Uh, well, Peter, you know, <laughs> To me, it, it just speaks back to, you know, regardless of what you're going to spend the, the money on, um, if you have the propensity to be able to do it, uh, your, your risk is, is increased. So before we start tackling carbon, uh, Tanashi, you'd also, you know, refer to, to COVID um, and, and the, you know, what impact that is, is having on agricultural trade. And I mean, we've seen it in no uncertain terms in our own backyards, is that, you know, uh, those that, that have the propensity to provide the subsidies have bailed out their farmers, even their, their agro-processing industries, um, and, given them, and given them massive grants to help them deal with, with COVID. And we, we are on the receiving end of that. Uh, I think the impact of COVID uh, as, you know, as, as a pandemic uh, is felt is felt harder um, on African countries, and we have we have less uh, financial propensity to respond. Um, and then over and above that, we we feel we feel the impact from those who do have the money to spend on providing that that relief. Um, and I, I think much of that you will see also spilling over into the into the carbon debate. Right, thanks, Hilton. I think I'll take this one last one. I'm wondering if Ed Winnie is still with us. It's a great question. I think he's very well placed to answer it. The question is from Devlin Busura. Hello, Devlin. Uh, so to what extent are members implementing the 2015 Nairobi decision on export competition, or is it still elusive? Now, is it when he's still with us? Yeah, I'm still here. Ah, great. I'm okay, actually, great. I also have one of my colleagues, Cedric Penn, who is, um, Cedric is actually the person dealing with, I don't know if he's there, but generally I think countries have been implementing. We've had almost all the countries, I think with the exception of one or two members, but a number of countries have modified their schedules as a result of the decision in Nairobi. And a greater focus here at the WTO is enhancing the, monit uh, the monitoring of the Nairobi decision. Um, it's still unfinished business. There are some members who would like to see 
an improvement. And if this is one of the issues currently being discussed in the negotiations as to how we can enhance the Nairobi decision. But generally, I think countries have abided or they have actually fulfilled their commitments. As I said, most of the countries have actually, um, I don't know if Cedric is on, but I think the list about one or two countries are yet to modify their schedules. But by and large, I think countries have fulfilled the obligations. But a lot of um, importance is also being given to monitoring so that to prevent any backsliding. And clearly, the long-term view, Canada and a number of countries believe the decisions can be enhanced. And that is part of the negotiations. But um, I can ask Cedric. Cedric, are you online? I think he's not. Um, but if you want to have a list, I can ask Cedric to send you the list of countries which have actually modified their schedules, if it will be of interest to um, the person who asked the question. Thank you, Peter. That's great. That, thanks, Adrini. And we can circulate that along with uh, a recording of the session because we have been recording, um, just to make that clear. Uh, so we'll circulate the link to it, plus that list if we can get it, Edwini. I'll just ask Hilton and Desi whether they have any final comments to make before we close. Start with you, Hilton, and then, then Desi. Well, thank you, Peter, and thank you very much to everyone who, uh, you know, who joined us this morning. Uh, remains for me to to say that one of the products uh, that is listed as an agricultural product in uh, the, the annex to the agreement on agriculture that never made it onto Desi's graph is wine um, and is a great export product from the region where, where I'm sitting this morning and I'd just like in closing to encourage everyone to have a good bottle of South African wine on your Christmas table this year. <laughs> Thank you and a Merry Christmas to everybody. Well, thanks. Thank I should point out that South Australia is the heart of the Australian wine industry. <laughs> Much as I'm South African, I'll be having a glass of South Australian wine. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. Desi, any last uh, questions or comments? Uh, thank Great you, enough. Peter. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining us on this uh, uh, discussion. So the report has a lot of uh, important uh, 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 points. So, uh, I mean, we just present the most important ones, but I strongly recommend everyone to just go through the report because it has much more uh, important points than what we have discussed here. So, uh, have a nice reading. Thank you so much. Great. A uh, holiday reading, of course, for your glass of South African wine or South Australian wine. It's required reading. So thanks colleagues for joining us and for staying the course. Uh, we appreciate that uh, the technical startup was not ideal, um, but we got there in the end and I think we had a robust uh, conversation. So it remains for me to thank our panel. Uh, thank you, Hilton. Thank you, Desi. Thank you, Edwini, for stepping in up and being an informal panelist. Uh, and thanks also to my colleagues in the Institute who work behind the scene to rescue the, <laughs> the event, so to speak. We were quite close to pulling the plug because we could not figure out what was going on. But we got there in the end. Thank you very much and good morning or good night or good day from wherever you are. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody.